Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, so from the world of Lego and fun to banking and regulations. Uh, Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about building uh, a data lake in Azure using serverless components. Um, what we did here is uh, we took um, the, so basically we took a model that we've used a number of times, uh, a data lake. A data lake is something that is uh, typically is known for failure, for high costs, for long time to delivery. Pretty much, uh, it's, it's it's not got a good rap. And, uh, and, and this is going to be a story about how we've turned that around, how we've done it quickly, how we've done it at high quality, how we've done it in, uh, how I've done it in a bank banking and regulated environment, and how we've done it with a culture of build to operate. So firstly, me, my name's Carl. Uh, I'm CTO at BJSS. I've been working in distributed computing basically for all my career. Uh, my normal, my normal uh, theme and my normal hobby is dystopian futurism, so this is a little bit different for me. And I'm an avid shoe collector. So the, the challenge we were set here by this organization was to, uh, to build a, a modern data platform, uh, but do it use case by use case, piece at a time. And the first use case we had was to take uh, ingest of daily data, quite a lot of daily data, to be fair, that was uh, done already in an ETL process that takes an incredibly long amount of time. It's from a mainframe format called EBCDIC. If anybody's ever worked with it, it's really horrible. It's about 30 years old. It's binary. You can't read it at all. Uh, and you're charged a very loud amount of money to transform that into something readable. So to take that, to process that in, in a distributed fashion, to perform a number of aggregations, calculations, to create features that analytics, data science can run on the, on the back of, and to uh, load that data, which is used throughout the banking organization, into a self-service platform where anybody can query it, anybody can see dashboards about that information, data scientists can then use it to run their, to run their models upon. So, sounds simple, right? The complexities, we had to do this in four months. We had to do this into production environment in banking. We had to do this with PII data in that time, in a regulated environment. We had to do this in a way that they could reuse for all their other use cases in the future. This is one, whilst we did it for one use case to start with, this was to support a data lake type functionality throughout their organization going forward. So it starts to sound a little more of a challenge. And certainly it would have been in the past. Um, I, I used, I've worked in distributed computing and data for a long time. In the times of on-premise, when you'd have run up your own Spark cluster or Hadoop, this would have been a very, very tough challenge. In fact, when I first worked in this, I remember a great quote a colleague of mine made that was, Hadoop makes the impossible possible, and the possible really blimmin' difficult. That is absolutely the truth. And I, and I as in the cloud, made that, that a little bit easier. I could start my other environments more easily, but it's still, Hadoop, distributed computing, Spark, those kind of things, they're really, really hard to manage and operate. They take a lot of effort. Things like HD Insight, EMR, they, they really lowered that barrier. That, that really, really sped up that process. But you still have to operate those. It's still uh, to a point. That's still, uh, there's still a lot of difficulty. And uh, it still takes a lot of effort. But recently, in the last year or so, we've seen a real movement of the serverless paradigm into the data lake, into the data lake and modern data warehousing world. Uh, we were talking last night, and uh, Danny, my colleague, who's going to speak in a minute, uh, she, she pointed out on a, brief, on a project she's working on at the moment, they started with a vision of uh, setting up EMR and, uh, and Apache Airflow to do uh, some ETL. And uh, it didn't take them long before they moved, in their case, to AWS Glue because, the, because of the need to get things out quickly versus very, very long lead times. So uh, in fact, Gartner said a little while ago, 60% of big data projects fail. And then Nick Hudecker, the chap who, uh, who said this, revised it a little bit later to 85% of big data projects fail. The reason for this is, well, multiple. But it's basically not interacting with the business, not understanding what the re real needs are, finding it hard to operate. Now, technology doesn't just magically change those. But the reason for all of this is that before the serverless paradigm moved into this space and made this so easy and quick to iterate on, which we're going to take you through in a minute with this use case, uh, it, was, it was really, really difficult. And technologists and IT departments would hoard all this stuff away from the business because it was so difficult to operate, it would break all the time. And they were worried about giving it to real users. 
So they'd hide it all away. It would take a very long time for people to get on it. And thus, it wouldn't do the things people wanted. They wouldn't get access to their data. Shadow IT would get in place. And data lakes basically failed. So whilst they were right, the technology has, was part of the reason that, that these problems occurred. So at a very high level, what does our solution look like in practice? Well, we got a number of different uh, components. For our example, uh, so this is all in Azure. We've got Azure Data Factory to do all the orchestration of the data. We've got uh, Azure Databricks distributed capability for processing and analytics. We've got data lake storage. For those of you who've used S3 for uh, an Athena, those kind of things, data lake storage allows you to store all of your files in a, hi in a, in a hierarchical file system with, direct, uh, with, a, with a driver that allows you to query those files directly from multiple different mechanisms. It's basically like a deep file system. Uh, we have all our PII filtered off somewhere else and encrypted separately. Uh, we have SQL Data Warehouse, now renamed Synapse which allows us to, to model that data and query that data. And we have Power BI. We have a number of supporting capabilities as well. Now, in that entire stack, there isn't a, we don't have to manage a single server anywhere. Uh, many of those capabilities are actually truly serverless and only charge you for execution. And many of them are making steps towards that entirely. So Synapse, for example, the new, uh, the new stuff in Synapse, you can, you can run that in an entirely serverless model. Uh, Danny's going to explain how Databricks works in serverless and the, the pathways they're going on. And to be fair, doing all of that in four months into production in a banking environment might have been a bit difficult. So we took an approach to this, which is to steal thread your data lake, much like you would do any type of, uh, any type of agile project. Whilst it doesn't sound totally unique, or well, not at all unique, this is, a, this is an approach that basically nobody takes to building modern data warehouses and data platforms. The idea that you take a use case and you build the pieces of it you need to deliver that use case, and you do that next and next and next, rather than looking to build a huge, huge pool of data and all the features you, and all the functionality you might need to query and analyze that data. And by taking that approach, we were able to genuinely de deliver what we needed to for this client in a short period of time. So, Having talked about the very high level, I'll hand over to Danny, uh, a lead data engineer on this project, who will, who will talk you through the detail. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, my name is Yodanka. I'm a data engineer at BGSS. Um, so I started my career doing machine learning and processing data at scale, and I'm a self-proclaimed Spark nerd. So I want to start by talking about the two main Azure services we used in this project that helped us make this project a success. Those are Data Factory and Databricks. So Data Factory is a data integration service. What this means is that it allows you to co orchestrate complex data workflows where you say, extract some data from a SQL database, apply some data transformation logic, and then push that transform data into a SQL data warehouse. Um, so the, a really cool thing about Data Factory is that Teams don't necessarily need to write any code to start prototyping their data workflows. Um, it's completely serverless. It has this nice UI which allows you to drag and drop different components, and it integrates with Azure functions very well. It also integrates with a lot of the uh, other Azure data offerings, such as Databricks. And from last year, um, Data Factory introduced something called mapping flows, which allow you to even abstract away from the data transformation code that runs in distributed set, uh, fashion and completely do this um, in a codeless way from, from Data Factory. What about Databricks? So Databricks is a data analytics platform. Has anyone here ever used Databricks? Cool. So Databricks is a data analytics platform that allows data scientists and data engineers to write uh, code which ultimately gets executed in a distributed processing manner. Um, it uses Apache Spark in the background to do this. Um, Apache Spark is a distributed framework that's very commonly used in large-scale um, data projects. And um, so essentially, Databricks is a managed Spark service with an interface, interactive notebooks, and most importantly, a serverless mode. It was actually a brand new Azure service when we first started working on this project, which came with its benefits and challenges. And I'll talk a bit about the challenges in a later slide. So Databricks has this serverless pool uh, which got introduced recently. And what it essentially allows you to do is it eliminates all the complexity that 
comes with, with management and configuring of, of distributed clusters. So anyone who's used HD Insight or EMR in the, in the past can testify to the fact that it's a pain to configure a cluster for maximum resource utilization. So um, what Databricks serverless pools do is they scale storage and compute automatically. Um, and the way it does that is that Databricks has a managed completely Databricks managed pool of workers available to pick up work. And there's some idle workers that sit and wait in the background um, to, to do the processing. So um, that dramatically decreases the auto scaling times of your processing workloads. And it also dramatically uh, decreases the, the cluster startup times. Um, so if I move away from Databricks. So this is how we actually first started creating our data factory and Databricks workflows. This is what the data factory UI looks like. So the way we would start prototyping is we would put in all the different, different components that we wanted to create as part of our workflow. Um, so as you can see, there's a Databricks service there uh, integrated, plugged in in the data workflow. And you need to do some simple configurations like specifying the maximum number of workers and maybe parameters you want to pass down to your Databricks notebooks. And if you click on the debug button, what this essentially allows you to do is to execute the whole workflow with all the business logic manually and verify that it's, it's performing what it should be doing correctly. Um, and then if you're happy with that, if you're happy with your workflow, you can click on the publish button. Now, a really cool feature of, of Data Factory is that you can configure the, uh, the publish of your Data Factory workflows to integrate with Git repositories. And the publish button actually allows you to uh, generate the infrastructure as code template for your workflow. So it, it essentially is like an infrastructure as code, uh, code generator. Um, so that's essentially how we started prototyping our data pipelines at first. We ended up building a whole lot of them, so we needed to prototype quickly. Uh, once we were happy with our data workflows and sort of the prototyping stage was over, we would turn to the infrastructure as code templates. We used ARM, which is the as your native infrastructure as code language template. Um, and we would do some tweaking uh, on, on those templates. So maybe modify things like parameter names. Data Factory tends to auto -gen generate really, really long parameter names for your, for your uh, parameters in, in the infrastructure as code templates. And maybe embed some more security controls. So we would tweak the templates according to our needs. And once we're happy with the templates, we would go on and integrate it into our CI CD pipelines. Of course, it was no perfect. There were some things that, um, some learnings that came about when we started uh, using, using Databricks. So as I said, it was almost a brand new Azure offering when we started working on this project. And that uh, came with some, some inherent issues. So um, the first issues came about when we tried to integrate it with our CI CD pipelines. Ideally, we wanted to, our platform engineers and the data engineers wanted to have a completely automated CI CD pipeline. Uh, but with Databricks, that wasn't exactly possible. There were a set of manual steps which needed to be performed. So things like authenticating our build agent to, to be able to um, authenticate against Databricks, that wasn't possible uh, to be done except from the Databricks UI. Uh, and the other thing was adding users to Databricks workspace was also a bit of a manual process. So we actually attended the conference, uh, works, workshop with, uh, Data Fact, sorry, with Databricks and Microsoft where we told them about our deployment struggles. Um, they were quite good. They, they listened to all of our, all of our complaints. Um, and they, they've integrated in their future roadmap. So it was really cool working together with them. And, and seeing you know, how they're man managing to progress and build like, such a really, really great service in the cloud. Um, so we've, we've kept in touch and we, with them, and we know that they're working on those features at the moment. Um, with Data Factory, I think Data Factory is great when you want to start prototyping and creating data workflows. It's um, hard. It, it comes with a lot of difficulties when it comes to creating really, really complicated data workflows where you have chained pipelines, when you have to pass parameters down each pipeline and configure the trigger uh, correctly. But I think it's a great tool to start working with and start prototyping. But what about production? So I've spoken about using Data Factory and Databricks and taking advantage of all their user experience and all the, the cool features they have. 
there's quite a bit to think about when it comes to productionizing a, a software system. And I want to address the four main things that we needed to, to think about when it came to productionizing, productionizing the system we were building. Those are logging, monitoring, and alerting, security, creating an efficient testing strategy in the cloud, and auto release automation, CI CD pipelines. So first, let's talk about logging, monitoring, and alerting. Why is that important? Well, imagine you have a data pipeline in production and suddenly it breaks. Uh, you don't know what's happened. So you need to be able to uh, know what's happened straight away and have enable your data engineers to go and check the logs, have a monitoring dashboard where they can see what's gone wrong and immediately fix it. Um, some of the data pipelines we built were core to the business and needed to operate effectively because hundreds of downstream processes were relying on the availability of the output data. Um, so the good news is that Data Factory is really well integrated with Azure logging and monitoring stacks. You can configure it to push logs into uh, log analytics and create really, really powerful dashboards for monitoring. Um, and those dashboards support the SQL-like language, which allows you to create very customizable monitoring dashboards for your data engineers so they can go in there and create their own kind of custom dashboards for, for login monitoring purposes. Um, the other cool thing is that you can actually configure dashboards to uh, show, to monitor across different workflows and data factories if you wanted to. And the other thing we did is we looked into alerting. So uh, we set up action groups so that we could notify, for example, data scientists where new data was available in the data warehouse so they could start their analysis on fresh data. And we would also alert data engineers if, if something had gone wrong with the pipelines. Um, and action groups are great for that because it means you target specific individuals to work on that specific problem at that time. Security. So we worked in a very highly regulated industry where sensitive data was flowing through the system at all times. Uh, there was quite a bit to think about. So um, the first thing is we had to mask encrypt and segregate all of the sensitive data. We're talking about PII and PCI data as well. Um, we made sure that everything in production um, where, this, where um, PII and PCI data was flowing through the system was isolated from external connectivity. And we also made sure that the interaction between the services that we had in our system was built in such a way that they would only expose the information they need to connect and talk to each other and not expose any more information. Um, we also use multiple key votes to store keys and secrets. The reasons we did that is we didn't want to introduce a security bottleneck by just keeping one key vote with all our keys and secrets. So we kind of coupled our services with their own key votes for that reason. And finally, we also integrated a lot of uh, infrastructure security tests into our deployment process to make sure that we're not introducing any security loopholes in, in future releases. Now, when it comes to testing in the cloud, I think, I think testing serverless components and testing in the cloud is, is quite challenging for a few reasons. So I think a lot of the, the previous speakers uh, spoke about testing in the cloud. There's not awfully many things you can test locally on your machine. Uh, you can do things like unit testing on your machine. Uh, you can use mock services. You can use things like local stack to test, um, test uh, services in the cloud. Uh, or mock them, but uh, you, you have no guarantee that mocking them would give you exactly the same behavior on your machine as it will perform in the cloud. So I think a really good strategy is to be able to enable your da data engineers to test what they can locally. So run your unit tests locally, but have the ability to test everything else in the cloud. The other thing about testing uh, in the cloud and testing serverless components is you need to be familiar with all the different APIs. Um, for the services that you use to be able to test them. So Databricks actually has a dozen of APIs all serving different purposes. There's the jobs, the secrets API, um, and so many others. Uh, Data Factory has its own API, and Data Lake has too. So our, our framework, uh, our testing framework that we created was using all of those. Now, when it comes to CI, CD, we used Zero DevOps for that. Um, I think Azure DevOps is a great product because it packages a lot of functionality all in one place. So your team has their Scrum board, their Git repos, their CI/CD pipelines, and their artifact repository all in one place. 
So I personally don't come from a platform engineering background, but Azure DevOps really helped me understand how to create CI CD pipelines and how to automate the whole release process. Um, another cool feature that Azure DevOps has is that it views um, Azure test, uh, test reports, test reports which uh, show you how many tests or what kind of tests you've run as part of your release. And that was really good when we um, wanted to demonstrate that work in front of stakeholders and um, that gave them a lot of confidence seeing the huge amount of tests that we'd build um, in, in Azure DevOps. This is what the release pipeline looks like. Um, so to give a bit of background, so imagine a, a pull request has been merged into a master branch. It's kicked off a build here. The build has exceeded. So it's kicking off automatically. It's kicking off the release pipeline, going to uh, deploy into development, uh, the development environment, and then after that, moving automatically to QA, performance, UAT, and finally production. Um, you can actually set up manual gates uh, so at, at the production level, you could have an experienced engineer who checks the logs, checks, inspects, inspects the deployment to make sure everything is okay before hitting that green button of approval. And you can zoom in into the different tasks. So if you click on one of those environments, you can see the different, the different tasks that have run um, as part of your deployment. If you click on each of them, you can see the logs. And you can also look at logs of, of things which are currently running, um, and you can download them if you wanted to. This is how you create different steps. So really cool thing about Azure DevOps is it comes with 100 integrated services that you can configure out of the box. There's awfully many things you can do from the UI. Um, and I think right now it's possible to start building your infrastructure as code, uh, sorry, your CI CD pipelines using YAML and import your YAML code uh, into Azure DevOps, or you could go the other way around and start from the UI and then export that. Um, that feature is not quite there yet for the release pipelines, but as I said before, there's awfully many things you can do in the UI to configure and create a release pipeline, um, and it's, it's actually quite easy. So I think a good strategy is to probably, with Azure DevOps, is to probably start from the UI build your initial CI CD pipelines, show it to your stakeholders, and then as you go along, you can actually export the YAML, do some, embed some more security controls, and incrementally deliver your CI CD pipelines. Great. Uh, thank you. So uh, in conclusion, we, we managed to deploy all of this and into live and into production in a banking environment in four months. I genuinely think that the progression of the serverless paradigm into the data space is the savior of the modern data warehouse or the data lake. I think it has made a huge difference and will continue to make a huge difference. It is progressing. There is, uh, you know, parts, parts, of, uh, parts of that solution and parts of these solutions still do cost money to run in the background. Parts of them are truly only paid on execution. Uh, that it is really progressing through there, and I do really believe that it won't be very long until we have full data solutions where every part of it is truly a serverless data model from end to end. Um, and the speed you can do these things with uh, is, is really impressive. Not only that, we've, we've used this model a number of times with different clients. It's worked so successfully. We've built a reference architecture off the back of it. We've built a load of automation that spins it up every time, so we can now do it much, much quicker every time. And we've built a culture and a behavior around it that allows you to do true DevOps with data and data pipelines, which is actually something that many people haven't been able to do yet and is a, and is a topic that a lot of people are really, really interested right now, how you do true data with DevOps. So yeah, I really think the technology has, uh, has massively helped. And I think uh, if, you're, if you're looking down this avenue and you've been looking at data lakes and technology, uh, in, uh, whether it's uh, HD Insight, whether it's EMR, those kind of things, consider this kind of stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm.